Hello, Internet. Hope you're having a great day today. It's your good friend Chase Jarvis here, founder and CEO of Creative Live and uh, your compadre in this crazy time here. I'm coming at you live from the front room of our little cabin. It's been in my family for 90 years, so I hope you enjoyed the wood paneling. But more importantly, we are in for an amazing conversation today. If, you're, uh, if you've been watching creativelive.com slash TV and you're seeing us here, um, this is the Chase Jarvis Live Show where I sit down with many of the world's top creators and entrepreneurs, and I do everything I can to unpack their brains whether that helps you live your your best life in uh, in career and hobby. And ultimately, the goal for today is for you to be able to ask some questions, for you to get some nuggets from my guests that I will introduce in just a second. But before we do, we're also streaming to a lot of different platforms on Facebook, on YouTube Live. So if you're joining us there, you can enter some comments or head over to creativelive.com slash TV. There's a video right there. You can hit join chat, and then I will see all of your comments coming in. Uh, presumably, we are we will be um, hearing from folks from all over the world if this broadcast is anything like uh, the other broadcasts we've been doing since the COVID struck. And uh, if you're familiar with Creative Live, this is where uh, more than 10,000, 12,000 hours of content from many of the world's top creators. We teach things um, like photography, design, filmmaking, how to make a living and a life doing what you love. And we launched Creative Live TV to bring you into the homes, the couches, the kitchen counters, the studios, the offices, um, the desks of our community, um, because these are very, very strange times. So we hope you'll enjoy this broadcast because today, we are going live with one of the most impressive guests we've ever had on the show. This is her second time. Um, she is um, Ms. Glennon Doyle, the author of the number one, still like four or five weeks straight since it came out, number one New York Times bestseller, Untamed, been at the top of like every bestseller list for the past uh, since it came out. And she's also in uh, Reese Witherspoon's book club. It's a selection for that um, for that community. Uh, she's also authored books like Love Warrior, uh, an Oprah Book Club selection, Carry On Warrior, an activist and thought leader. She is the founder and president of Together Rising, an all-woman-led nonprofit organization that has completely revolutionized the grassroots philanthropy industry, where she and her team there have raised more than $25 million, that's $25 million for women, families, and children in crisis. She lives in Florida with her wife and three children. My guest is the one and all, the, the inimitable Glennon Doyle in the house. Chase, it Thank is you. so good to be back together, sort of. <laughs> Together-ish. Ish, yeah. As, as a uh, very overtly introverted person, is this time, I mean, I know we, we, we can both hold the fact that there is crisis happening and this is one of the hardest times in the last century and find some solace and some comfort and uh, a, a way of living differently for someone who's introverted. Is this, is it, cause it kind of, is it okay for you or how is it? Chase, I mean, I think it was 20 days into quarantine. Abby said, is your life any different? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, it's not. I mean, it's you know what it is, Chase. It's a lot of freaking family togetherness. It's a lot. <laughs> it is, but it's I, you do such a great job of sharing uh, on your social channels. And for anyone who's interested, uh, it's just at Glenn and Doyle. Um, specifically, I'm referencing Instagram. Uh, I really enjoy singing your bulldog, uh, the good night <laughs> song, which is really really fun. But um, so a lot of family time. Three uh, children. Abby and yourself, uh, you guys are in Florida. I trust you're safe and everyone healthy. Yeah, we are. I mean, as I do run the nonprofit Together Rising, which has existed for a decade to serve women and children in need. And you can imagine that right now the needs are, I mean, yeah. we're, we're working double time just to keep up with the people. It's pretty amazing to be looking at the real pain out there every single day. And yes, at the same time, finding some joy in, um, I don't know, the stillness of it, the kind of slowness of it and the forced family togetherness. <laughs> well, it's just <laughs> good. And, and, yeah. And that's, you know, uh, before we get into your latest book, I think it's really interesting to um, examine this 
you know, what, what I, I, I said off the cuff, but I wanted to hear a little bit more from you, how we can both be present with the pain that's happening in the world right now, not just for the people who are struck with the virus, but for those serving them, for the alienation, the isolation, um, and a lot of really hard times, and find, um, find like you said, the stillness, the opportunities. Um, there, there's got to be some element of self-discovery for everyone, certainly even for you doing a book tour, being the, the number one book in the country on basically every platform and, you know, talking about that from your own home, that's got to be both calming and disjointed. I'm wondering if you can help reconcile this. And, and I know you've overtly, again, talked about uh, a life that has um, been peppered with anxiety, and this is a very anxious time for so many. So, how do we reconcile those two? I guess, or how do you reconcile those two things? And can you provide a little guidance for those of us that are are really conflicted in this tough time? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons why I, it's it's strange that, that my book happened to come out at this time, but I do think it's largely a book about using pain as a um, springboard, you know, rock bottom kind of as a starting place for coming to life and for creativity. Um, and, I, and I think one of the things that's going on right now is there's all that pain out in the world that we all see. And some of us are the ones going through that pain. I mean, people mm -hmm. are losing people that they aren't even, they can't even say goodbye to. I mean, the yeah. stories that oh. we have heard in our inbox, people yeah. are losing jobs and people are losing livelihood and and everyone's lost um, what used to be, right? We've all yeah. lost. Um, but there's this other thing going on, Chase, that I think is so interesting to me as a recovering addict um, because it's while all this pain is going on, while this truth has been revealed to all of us that was always true, right? The truth, which is we are all as vulnerable as hell and none of us have control. And the only thing that's real at the end of the day is you know, our health and the people we love. That's always true, right? Yeah, yeah. But but now we can't avoid it. It's, it's like on we, display. It is like, yeah. Oh. And we're stuck at home without all the distractions that we usually keep ourselves um, busy with so that we don't have to face the terrifying truth of being human, right? That's, I think of it as um, when I was little, I had the snow globe that I mm. – that I, I was scared to death of because it had this little dragon in the middle of it that I thought was scary. So I'd keep it shaken up all the time. Like, oh, so I didn't have to see the dragon. Like, that's what we do, right? Yeah. We keep ourselves shaken up, shaken up with all the things and the things. So we don't have to face the truth of how scary it is to be human. And right now, all the snow is settling, right? And it's settling for all of us. And we are stuck in our homes. We're stuck with ourselves. We're stuck with the truth. We're stuck with our people. Right? For better or so, worse. For right? better or yeah. worse, right. So all the all the problems that we have inside and all the problems that we have in our relationships and all, all of this is unavoidable in this moment. It feels very much to me like early sobriety, right? Like everybody's been forced into a collective early sobriety, but nobody has the tools right now that a lot of us are lucky enough to get in early sobriety, which is community and people telling the truth. Um, the first time I ever went to, no, no, the fifth time I ever went to recovery meeting on this, my sixth day of sobriety, um, I stood up and finally spoke and I said something like, I'm Glennon and I'm an alcoholic and I feel horrible and I'm afraid that everyone else has a secret to life that I don't have because everything just feels harder for me than it seems for everyone else. Um, and I'm scared to death and that's all, thank you very much. And this woman came up to me at the, after the meeting and she sat down next to me and she said, I just wanna tell you this one thing that someone told me in early recovery. And that's this, the fact that it feels so hard does not mean that you're doing life wrong. It means that you're finally doing it right, right? The secret to life is that doing it right, being human right, feeling all of your feelings is just really, really hard. That's why so few people do it. Um, but the thing is that all feelings are for feeling, even the hard ones. And the only thing that's worse than feeling it all is missing it all. Mm -hmm. 
And that is, so, like power, that is like a power shot right there. Well, in Chase, it seems so obvious, right? Feelings yeah. are for feeling. But like, I swear to you, Chase, that I did not know that before that meeting. I, we live in a culture where we are told over and over again that happiness is for feeling, right? And that fear and shame and anger and envy and all of those other feelings are, are things to be ashamed of, right? They're for numbing and fixing and deflecting and ignoring and... So this concept that being human is not about feeling happy, but is actually about feeling everything was, it was and is the springboard for every good thing in my life, right? Every good thing in my life, my, my new um, marriage, my family, my sobriety, my art, my activism, all is a direct result from my commitment to quit numbing all of it, mm. right? To sit with the pain of being human and allow it to transform me. So that's what I think is the opportunity of this moment. I think everybody's really miserable because we're all in detox suddenly and we didn't ask for it. Um, but I think that it, we're kind of in like this cocoon of grief. Yeah. And I don't think we can help but emerge new after it. I think this will break us down in ways that will make us more human and more tender and more connected. I already feel that way. Do you? I feel I was walking my dog the other day and this guy, this old guy was walking, but I live in April, so everyone's old. He was walking his um, dog, you know, 10 feet away. And I was like, hi, hi. <laughs> and Abby was like, you don't even like that guy. And I was like, I like him now. I like everyone now. And the old days are over, you know? So, I don't know. I think that, that this time of intense vulnerability and intense pain, um, if we surrender to it and allow it to change us, can have beautiful after. Well, if you're just joining us, um, I'm sitting down with Glennon Doyle, um, number one New York Times bestseller of lots of books, most recently Untamed. Um, and I don't know where you're seeing this, whether it's on Facebook Live or YouTube Live, but know that I'm seeing all your comments right now. Uh, I'd love to know where you're listening or watching from. Um, if you have some questions that I can serve up to Glennon, I'd be happy to do it. Um, just you know, go ahead and type a little comment there or head over to creativelive.com slash TV and I will get your questions there. Um, well, thank you for articulating that thing that we're all feeling, um, the, both the frustration, the sadness, the ennui, the, um, the desire to connect, you know, we're social animals. That's what people forget. Even the introverts, right? I, I like, I have that same exact experience walking down the road. If there's someone over there, I'm of course, first making sure it's safe, which is a weird calculation to do every time you see a human. I was... <laughs> I, like it's so weird. I was driving. I went had to go to the grocery store, masked up, all that stuff. And I'm I I realized that I'm, I think it might be judgment, like mm -hmm. making sure. And I think it comes from a scared place, making sure everyone around me is safe. But I'm like safe, safe distance. It, it's just a, such a weird calculus to do, but also simultaneously like, I wonder what that person's story is. I wonder if that person's lonely. I wonder if this person has. Um, is there, they're an elder. Are they scared to go into the store right now? Is there like, it just, there's so much, it, it, I feel overwhelmed and, and yet there, I feel like we're getting something that, that has to happen. And I, it's a weird feeling to feel like I would never wish this. I'd never wish the pain. And it's like, I appreciate you sharing your insight there. Cause it's something that I'm, I'm trying to reconcile and I'm, I haven't quite figured it out yet. So and just, uh, I think there's something beautiful about when you said we're social animals. I mean, I haven't, of course, seen anybody in real life, right? <laughs> Which I don't normally see anybody in real life. <laughs> 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 I was just telling Chase that 19 days into quarantine, Abby said, is your life any different? <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, not really. Um, I there's the people that I am talking to on Zoom or, you know, I have noticed this level of vulnerability that I've never noticed in people before. So I'm seeing people that I work with or um, know in ways I've never seen them before. I'm seeing them in their homes. I'm seeing them with children and dogs crawling all over them. I'm seeing them in their kitchen. I'm seeing them afraid. I'm seeing them without all the answers. 
without their, you know, representative shiny, fancy face with their real human face. Mm. Um, and that is something, that's something. I don't know what it is exactly, um, but it reminds me of recovery meetings. Mm. It reminds me of how real people are in recovery meetings. It reminds me of this, this thing that happens to human beings when you're in a situation where it's like, okay, the jig is up. All of us can stop pretending and really yeah. be human with each other. It's so right? true. I, and I've loved, like my wife, Kate, and I don't have any kids. Uh, it was a choice we made. People ask us a lot of questions about it. And I'm an uncle. I have a shirt that says Funkle, with this fun uncle to lots of kids. <laughs> I bet you are. I bet but you are. I, I have had the experience with coworkers and um, people that are in the creative life community, our partners and whatnot of like seeing their kids, the cat runs through the, you know, there's a noise going on in the kitchen. You get to see the wood paneling and the shag carpet of our little, of our little beach house. It's been in our family for like, to me, there's this weird connection that I actually think can't get to us any other way. Like I can't think of another experience in the last hundred years that where we have the ability to connect remotely and tap into one another's lives because in the 1918 Spanish flu, you're just going to walk by people's houses. You don't get to go in with a camera. So is it, is it weird to be grateful for this moment? Because I feel so conflicted. No, I mean, listen, as someone who, uh, God, I'm together rising. Like if I did not spend if I didn't make it a spiritual practice to be able to enter into people's pain every single day and to allow that pain to make the beautiful even more beautiful, like that's the thing. Like it doesn't, you know, people say to me all the time, like, how do you deal with all that stuff? It's so heavy. Like, how do you listen to all those stories and then move on? Like that heavy stuff to me is the good stuff. Yeah. What crushes me Give me, you know, two hours of small talk where people are talking about bullshit for two, like, that makes me want to die, you know, but like, no, 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 this is the good stuff. Like, we, we have this word called brutal, like life is beautiful and life is brutal at the exact same time, all the time, every day. This isn't new. Like mass pain, people suffering, none of this is new. This happens every single day. And to me, the people who are able to still find joy in times like this are the people who enter into the suffering with other people, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's the feeling of despair. Despair is very distinct. Despair I see mostly in people who so badly want to do something or so badly want to be connected, but can't do and don't tell themselves they can't and don't, right? People who are, um, you know, the, 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 the people who are showing up, who are zooming their parents? Who are zoom? Who are you know reaching out? Who are really those people aren't feeling despair. They're feeling pain, yeah. the normal pain of being human. Yeah. But um, no, I think that the more we enter into the real stuff with people, the more beauty there is. More I I, stuff I saw you say something online. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's sometime in the last couple of days. You know, like I as an I think you you started it something like as an introvert. I feel. For you i'm connected to you i would die for you i just won't have a cup of coffee with you <laughs> hell to the no <laughs> hell no ask me for my left lung do not ask me to starbucks i'll tell you what no i love deeply humanity but actual human beings are tricky for me <laughs> right i want to love people from my home in my in my, in my writing well, People magazine called you the patron saint of female empowerment. And that is um, an amazing, um, I don't know, label to get. But I feel like you're so much more. There's, there's a part of your work um, that is therapy. There's a part of your work that is courage. There's a part of your work um, that um, connects us. There's a part of your work that... Um, empowerment feels like just that's like the gateway that is like you step inside you see maybe even the outside you see it from the outside and step into it and it's you know of course people magazine um talked about female empowerment um as a male i still feel and and feel like i gain empowerment from your message as someone who is looked to um by so many uh not just in your books but um with 
you know, together rising and all the work that you do, is that exhausting or is that, does that give you the energy that drives you? Um, I feel that the reason it is not exhausting is that I made myself a promise a long time ago that I would never, ever try to be anything other than exactly what I am, right? So um, I have never promised to have any answers at all. I think one of the reasons why people trust me is because I'm always admitting that I don't know shit. <laughs> so um, I I feel bl- lucky that my sobriety um, demands that I only worry about doing the next right thing and that, that the only thing I really have to care about is integrity. And to me, integrity doesn't mean doing the right thing because what does that even mean? But it does mean um, having your inner self and your outer self integrated which means that I can't ever have any shame or lies on the inside because that's what takes me out. That's what takes addicts out. That's what takes everyone out. So, I mean, this has been tested in my life, Chase. I mean, the last time we were, you interviewed me. Yep. I was released in Love Warrior, which was touted as, you know, the epic marriage redemption story. But I fell in love with Abby a few weeks before that book launched. And so I freaking had to have meetings today with huge tables of people in New York of all all of these people who had, whose careers were based on this, you know, partly based on this book succeeding and say, sorry, I I have to announce, I have to tell everyone. Like I can't, my sobriety, like I had people say to me, um, if you announce a divorce, weeks before your epic marriage redemption book launches, it'll be career suicide. Like it'll be over game over. And also if you lady with your largely faith-based um, base, you know, also throws in that you're going to go ahead and, and marry a, a female Olympian, like game over. <laughs> right? And, um, and I remember thinking, okay, I guess if I have to decide between career suicide and soul suicide, I will just choose career. Right. So that was the biggest test for me of like, can I do this thing where I'm actually telling the truth in real time and still have a career? Um, and of course, as the truth always does, I told the truth. I told it as, um, you know, as much as I could tell without sacrificing my children and family's process and the world handled it. And the world always handles it because the world cannot believe truth anymore. It just sounds different, doesn't it? The <laughs> truth sounds different. You it's know true. it when you hear it. And I, uh, so uh, can I dive a little bit deeper into this? Because we touched, we touched on it in our, in our last conversation, but for anyone who's just joining right now, um, if you could go a little bit deeper in recounting that, um, just what I know is that you, you had this marriage redemption story and, I want to explore two things simultaneously and I'll let you figure out how you want to address them. One is just a, a little recap of that story for anyone who's new to your work. Although, you know, it's, there's probably like eight people on the whole planet that are new to your work because you've been crushing it so hard. But the part that I, I also think is fascinating is all of the people, and these are people that you respect and appreciate their peers or their collaborators, co-conspirators at you know, the biggest publishers in the world. Some of these are, are dear, dear friends and they're telling you that it's career suicide and they're telling you that it's, you know, your faith-based base, it will leave you because uh, you're marrying a woman and yet you do it anyway. And not only does it not pan out like they tell you, but arguably like, I mean, that is where I really, really came into your work. It's like, that is truth. You know, with the truth, it sounds a certain way and you, once you've heard it, you can't unhear it. And it's so powerful. That is a very global stage for someone with your um, stature and, um, and, and, and your very public face. But that happens to people every day. People that they know and trust and appreciate are telling them things that are horrible towards their, their best outcomes. So two things, I don't care how, what order, give us a little recap for folks who are just tuning in and then address if you would how 
your experience there is so parallel to so many other people and what you have to do with the information that you get that you know isn't your truth. Yeah. Well, I think it's the story of all of our lives, right? I mean, the story of all of our lives, and I think especially the second half of our lives, is, you know, we spend the first half trying to match ourselves to the world's expectations, whether it's, you know, our families or the culture or whatever. And then we spend the the second half of our life trying to get out of those cages that we allowed ourselves to be put in for so long. So, um, yeah, so Chase, I was in a uh, bad marriage to a good man, okay? And that is uh, a very tricky place for a woman to be because, you know, we you can just convince yourself that it's just good enough, you know? And, and I was in the kind of marriage that women are trained to be grateful for, okay? And I was also slowly dying. Um, and uh, I... At the first, I wrote Love Warrior, um, it, which was the story of my husband's infidelity and our kind of just excruciating, but also beautiful effort to just save our marriage, right? Um, and a, a little bit before the book launched, at my first event to discuss Love Warrior, Abby walked into a room. And Chase, I just... I still don't understand what the hell happened. I just know that I, I, every bone in my body just screamed, there she is. Okay. And, and she's like, I had never even kissed a girl before. Okay. This is not like in my universe. I had no freaking clue what was going on. Um, and, um, and so the, the interesting part, which I never talk about is that we were together that evening speaking, okay? So we were with about 10 other authors and we were speaking to hundreds of librarians at this like book convention. <laughs> it's very sexy. <laughs> and so we were together in a big room for a couple hours with a bunch of other people. And then we went our separate ways. And I went to Naples and she went to Portland. And over the course of the next few months, we both dismantled our entire lives to be together. We were never in the same room again. Wow. We would never saw each other again. I know. That shit crazy. Okay. So I almost missed, though, that we've now been married for three years. Um, but I almost missed that most beautiful invitation I've ever received. Like, I almost did not follow that voice. I almost abandoned myself again, as I had been doing for my whole life because I was so freaking terrified of everything, of breaking everyone's expectations of me, of, of not being that good wife I was supposed to be, of not being a good mother, of not being a good employer. Like I was an employer. I was an employee. I was all, all of these people's lives had their lives a vested interest in mine. The most, the hardest one though, Chase was the mom thing. I mean, I just, mm. I, I just remember thinking I can't do this because I was tamed to believe that a good mom does not break her children's hearts. Right. And then one day I was braiding my daughter's hair and I just remember looking at her and thinking, Oh my God, I am staying in this marriage for her. But what I want this marriage for her, right? Mm, wow. And if I would not want this marriage for my little girl, then why am I modeling that love and calling that good mothering? Right? Yeah. And, and it's because I know why now, like it's because we just, women are just given these messages, you know, just these, I was trained to believe that a good mother is a martyr. Right, that, that the epitome of motherhood is just burying yourself, just burying your dreams, burying your ambition, burying your emotions, burying all of it in honor of your children. Right, like what a burden for kids yeah. to bury, to, to 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 carry, to be the reason that they the reason that they're right. Like I think that to to to, to be taught. I mean, this one kills me. To be taught that. In order to love or be loved, you have to disappear. Instead of the truth, which is that in order to be loved or or love, you have to fully emerge, mm. right? You have to keep appearing, as as scary as it is. And so, 
I just realized, oh my God, like this is, I have to throw that belief away. Like the culture gave me that belief and it's been controlling me. But a, to me, a good, mo- a good uh, mother is not a martyr. A good mo- mother is a model, right? Like yeah. our children will only allow themselves to live as fully as we will. So we so we can't settle for any any relationship or world that's less beautiful than the one we'd want for our children, right? So so I just kept realizing what are these other, you know, unconscious beliefs that are controlling me because I haven't examined them. Like my whole life became this this um quest to like dig up these roots and examine them, like all these messages that I've been getting about what a good girl does, what a good woman does, what a good wife does, what a good um, uh, mother does. They're all just the same exact message a million different ways, which is just disappear. Disappear. Good girls are quiet and pretty. Good wives are accommodating and pleasing. Good um, female workers are grateful and pleasant. Good uh, mothers are martyrs. Like just every message of disappear, disappear, disappear. And so, um, and, and, and the faith messages, forget it. I mean, I was taught in religion, like, just shut up. I mean, the first message I ever got as a little girl in the church was, okay, so God made Adam and they were like bros and everything was cool. And then Eve showed up, right? And what did she want? She wanted more. And then all hell broke loose, right? And suffering was unleashed on the earth. So the message was clear, like, just be grateful. Don't want more. Don't ask for more. Which is what I was doing in my life. I was looking at my marriage and my family and, and my life and saying, I, I actually want more than this. This is not the kind of love that I want. This is I want more. And so, Chase, I I mean, I had already told Craig. I had already, you know, broken Craig's heart. I had already told my children. And I had already told my freaking parents which by the way, was the scariest one. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So at that point, telling my agents was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will tell you that they, I did have to look them in the eye and tell them you are going to have to trust me. Like the thing is that when you're the artist, it is your job to keep doing the ridiculous thing, to, like that you have this little nugget of vision inside of you. And my nugget of vision was like, I don't think they like me because I'm perfect. I've never been perfect a day in my life. I'm a shit show. I think that they like me because I'm honest and brave. And what I'm about to do is honest and brave. And I think people are smarter and better than we think they are. And I think they're gonna get it. And I think some of it will even be inspired by it. So, um, my job was to keep believing in that vision. Their job was to keep being afraid and pushing back on it. But I wouldn't have been the artist they trusted me to be if I didn't. Like, that's the tension, yeah. right? That's the tension of the, of, of the art and the business. Like, you have to have both. But if you don't have, um, if the people on the business side aren't even kicking and screaming along for the ride, then you're dead in the water in the first place because nobody follows anybody who's not doing something that's new and true, right? So, um, so I, I um, announced it one day on Instagram. I posted a picture of me and Abby on a porch. She's playing the guitar, sitting next to her. Um, I told the story as clearly as I could with no apologies. Right. I mean, my, I was not going to be like, ah, oh, shucks about this whole thing. Like I was clear that, that, um, I was not interested in, um, feedback. <laughs> Amazing. Um, you know, there's this way of being, and I learned it with my parents because about this whole thing and so for a long while every time I talked to my mom I would get really defensive and anxious because Chase I don't think it's like the hate from I don't think it's like the cruel criticism from people that hate us that shakes us from our knowing I think it's like the quiet concern from people who love us right that's what's 
scares the crap out of us. Um, and so, and so I found myself constantly explaining myself to her and telling her how okay it was and how okay we were and how okay everything was until I realized like the only way you can ever convince other people that you're okay is to just go about being okay. Right. Cause once you find yourself explaining yourself or justifying yourself, that's proof you're not okay. People who are okay and happy and full of power and joy do not go around explaining to other people how okay and perfect and fine they are. They're just living their amazing, beautiful, wild, and precious life, right? So that's what I learned with my announcements, with my talking about it, that all I could do, but I mean, not a day in my life am I going to explain myself anymore. I mean, I'm 44 years old, I think. I actually had to Google that for a little bit. <laughs> I'm finished at 44. And I'm just done explaining myself. You know, I'm just going to live my life and be as okay as we are. And, and some people will be inspired by it and some people will be pissed off about it. And that's just. That is such a beautiful um, explication of a trial that so many people go through and arguably at a very, very, uh, at a much, you know, much different, um, every, of course, individual, but otherwise similar experience that you're getting input from the world to be a certain way, whether that's your parents want you to be a doctor, your faith wants you to be, um, uh, tamed to use the word that you used in your book. There's so many inputs and part of what I'm like, you do such a good job. I feel like um, sharing your story. I've listened to a lot of interviews and we've had a few conversations and I ask you to give advice and you just tell a great story, but is there, can you just look at the people, look, look into the camera and tell people right now, like there are people, you did say that the conversations with your parents and other folks were harder than the business and the art and the, so the creators and the entrepreneurs who are in our community, I think they gravitate, they can, they can do that, but it is their parents, their spouse, their partners, like these are, those are the tough conversations. And you, I feel like you shared that. What, what gave you the courage and how specifically did you approach that conversation? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly how I approached the, the situation with my parents. My bet is that taste, no matter what, no matter the challenges that everyone has, like you just said, with their boss, with their whatever. Shit comes down to your parents. I'm telling you, I know the fiercest activists, people who get on podiums in front of thousands and thousands and preach, preach freedom, preach justice, and then they cry at home about their parents. Like the expectations that our parents have, because and it's, and it's all because of love. It's because we love them so much and they love us so much, but they were created for a different world than we are, right? And so if we're not doing anything that they don't, that they don't understand, then we're not living for the new world that they weren't made for, right? It's just that they can't go into the future with us. And we actually don't have to go back into the past with them, right? We can love each other and still refuse to go backwards. Um, I will tell you one day, um, a long time after I told my mom, she was still worrying and calling that love, you know, just worrying and calling that love. And I was on the phone with her. And she was saying all the things she'd said, like, what, what about, what will the kids parent, uh, kids parents say, how will the world treat you? How? And I just had this moment of clarity where I thought, oh, my mom loves me. And she disagrees with me about what is best for me and my family. So I have a decision to make. I have to decide whether I trust my mother or myself more with my life, Right. And at that moment, I heard my mom say, okay, honey, your dad and I are going to come next week. We're going to fly and come visit. And Chase, I just heard myself say, no, you can't come here. You wow. can't come here because you are still afraid. And you, my children are not afraid. Wow. That life wants to be celebrated and that, and that it is best to be yourself and let the world catch up. So it, they don't carry the fear you carry, but if you bring it to this house, they will see it in your eyes and they will help you carry it because they love and trust you. So I have to tell you this hard thing, mom, which is that your fear is not my family's problem. 
And my job is to make sure it never becomes their problem. So go deal with your problem. And when you can come to my family with nothing but love and celebration, we will lower our drawbridge for you, but not one freaking second sooner. And that day is when I became an adult. That is the moment I became an adult because that is the day that I realized that we do not become responsible adults until we become disobedient sons and daughters, right? That the only true way, the only true way to honor our parents is to trust fully the people they raised, right? Ourselves. Um, and so, yeah, that was it. I mean, it's, it's as simple and as hard as that, right? It's, it's, um, figuring out that you are building a life. Like we use the analogy, Abby and I use the analogy of of an island. You are building an island with different specifications than the ones that your parents built. Right. And they had their, their turn and now it's our turn. Right. And anybody who comes to our island has to, uh, anybody, whether it's our parents, anybody has to approach as the respectful guests that they are. How did you, how did you, um, how did you learn to trust yourself? Sobriety. So I sometimes feel bad for people who are not addicts because. When you hit a rock bottom like I did, I mean, I was I was almost dead at 25, okay? I had been lost to food. I, I became bulimic when I was 10, and then that never, I just never got that taken care of. So that morphed into alcoholism, which morphed into all the other isms. And by the time I was 25, I was just, I don't know how far I was, but couldn't have been far. Um, and I found myself on a bathroom floor holding a positive pregnancy test. And I understood clearly that it was my last chance. I don't know how I knew that. I just knew this is it. Like, this is my last chance to come to life. It went to my first meeting. And, um, and over time, what I learned is this, Chase. So I just thought, I thought that there was something seriously wrong with me. I always thought that there was something seriously wrong with me. That's why I started binging with food and numbing myself. That's why... I just felt like I was so sensitive. Like I just was so freaking sensitive, Chase. And I didn't have the tools to deal with that as a child. So I just started numbing. And I think a lot of that's what happens to a lot of addicts is that they're highly sensitive people who don't have the tools to deal with their sensitivity. So they start self-medicating, right? Um, But what I've learned over the last 18 years of sobriety is that there was never anything wrong with me, right? That... I just didn't know how to use my fire yet, right? Like, because I'm still the exact same person I was when I was 10. So my, this, the sensitivity that led me to addiction is the exact same sensitivity now that makes me a really good artist, right? And the fire that, well, my therapist calls it anxiety, but whatever. My, I call it my fire. My fire that, that makes me sweaty and afraid a lot, um, is also, it's the exact same fire that makes me a really good activist, right? So what I'm telling, the reason I answered that way is because I think that we in our culture, both men and women, are trained not to trust ourselves. We're, We're trained not to trust who we really are. So like the messages that I got, I was like, stay small, stay quiet, stay pretty, stay whatever. So in our particular culture, boys would get the opposite message, right? Don't be vulnerable. Don't cry. Don't be all of these things. And so we get these messages about what we're supposed to be and not supposed to be. So we stop trusting who we are, right? I think we really forget who we are when we learn how to please. And so sobriety for me has just been one long returning to who I really, really am. That's what untamed is about and when I trust myself even when it's different than what everybody else wants from me when I trust myself when I speak and I tell my children confidence 
we just want you to live with confidence. And what the word confidence means, the, the, the roots of confidence are with, con, and thin, with fidelity, right? Live with fidelity to self. Disappoint as many people as you have to so you don't ever have to disappoint yourself, right? Abandon everybody else's expectations of you so that you don't have to abandon yourself. Um, and, and, and the beautiful thing about that is, is people who aren't listening carefully will hear that and say, oh, isn't that being selfish? And that's ridiculous because the truest beautiful version of me, when I give that to the world, that is exactly what the world always wants for me, right? And needs for me. When I give myself permission to live as my truest self, I grant permission to everyone in my circle to do the same. And that's all anybody wants is to be able to exist as who they are as freely as possible. So the best thing we can do for each other is to live with confidence so that everybody else gets that magic key to do the same thing. Do you prefer uh, the word confidence to trust? I noticed that I used the word trust, learn to trust yourself, and you shaped it to confidence. Are, is, there a, is there a significant difference between those? Is it semantics or is there something at the core of that? I think I'm just a word nerd and I just love when I figure out what words mean. And then I just love to throw them into interviews so it sounds smart. Oh, so I love it. Though. No, it's a, it's a better yourself. word. It's a yeah. better word. It's a like better if word. I can say things like the roots of confidence come with con and fit. if I can do that, I just throw <laughs> it. I mean, if I can do that, I'm not going to trust. <laughs> oh, it's so poetic, Lennon. Um, there's a, I want to shift and talk specifically about Untamed and it obviously there's like what you've just been sharing is the guts of the book and there's an analogy that you open with a story that you open with um, around about the cheetah and um, it's so powerful and uh, I've got the audio book and you, you did your own stunts, you read your own audio book. Um, I'm wondering if you can share that story because I feel like it is such a great on-ramp to the book. Thank you. Um, so yes, I, uh, a few years ago, had taken the girls, my daughters, to um, a safari park. And it was around the time where I was just feeling very stuck. And um, I just had this like longing inside of me for something more something different so longing you know and um and we went to see this event at the at the park called the cheetah run and um we were lined up on the side with all the sweaty families you know and this zookeeper walks out and she's holding the leash of a of a labrador and i was like okay this is not a freaking cheetah like if she tells my kids this is a cheetah <laughs> It's over, I'm right? Yeah. There, yeah. <laughs> but she says, um, this is Minnie. This is our cheetah, Tabitha's best friend. And we uh, raised Minnie alongside Tabitha the cheetah to tame her. So everything that Minnie does, Tabitha wants to do. So now you're going to watch Minnie run the, the, the cheetah race. And then Tabitha will run it. So we watch the lab run the cheetah run. Then... Tabitha the cheetah comes out of her cage and she is just majestic and humongous and her muscles are just like rippling underneath her fur and she lines up at the starting line pink bunny tried to and of course over time Tabitha has been trained to chase this dirty pink bunny right so the jeep takes off Tabitha takes off after it she's done in like two seconds she crosses the finish line zookeeper throws her this steak and she just like gnaws and gnaws it in the dirt and all the people are clapping and while all the people were clapping I just kept looking at Tabitha and thinking oh my god like all day long, this wild, powerful, fierce animal chases this dirty pink bunny down this 
well-worn narrow path that has been created for her, listening to the applause of sweaty strangers. This is what she thinks her life is, right? It felt very familiar to me. And then while the zookeeper, oh, this little girl raises her hand and she says, um, is Tabitha sad? Does Tabitha miss the wild? And the zookeeper says, no, honey, she was born in captivity. This is, she's safe here. This is a good life for Tabitha. She doesn't know any different. But then my daughter Tish, she like po uh, poked me and she said, mommy, look at Tabitha. And they had put Tabitha in this other field for the Q&A. And Tabitha, Chase, like her, she, she had changed. Like far away from us in this field, her posture had completely changed. She was pacing the periphery of the field. She was looking beyond it. Her, she looked regal and, and scary. And Tish goes, mommy, she turned wild again. And I just sat there, sat there and thought, okay, if a wild cheetah can be tamed away from herself, tamed to forget who she is, so can a woman, right? And I started thinking about all of the freaking dirty pink bunnies that I had been trained to chase my entire life. You know, be pretty, be small, be quiet, um, be pleasing, be grateful. And then I thought, oh my God, if the crazy thing is this, if you asked that wild animal, if we could talk to that wild animal, right? What would she say? Why, what would she explain? She would say, I just feel like it was all supposed to be more beautiful than this. I can just, I just, feel this longing to like sleep underneath star-filled skies, to chase and, and hunt and kill, right? She, she knows all of that. She's never seen the wild, but she knows it. And that's the same with us, right? Like we have this longing inside of us that it was all supposed to be more beautiful, This, but we look outside of ourselves and all we see are freaking labs chasing freaking pink bunnies. And we think that's all there is, which is why it is so important to return to our imaginations. I, this is what I believe. I believe that um, if we only look at what is outside of ourselves for what is possible, we will only get what we've always gotten. But in our imagination, in our imagination, it's not where we go to escape reality. It's where we go to discover ultimate reality, right? It's where we go to find the thing that we were meant to give birth to on this earth. So after that day, I just said, that. first of all, that's the perfect freaking metaphor for the book of Untamed. That's what I'm starting with. And um, I just wanted to be somebody who remembered her wild and who just stopped chasing the culture's mm. dirty pink bunnies. Uh, to say that the internet crowd is going wild would be the most mild way that I could possibly frame it. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, Gunther and Dawn and Warren and Jennifer and Joanna, um, People from every corner of the globe are, some are in tears, some are saying that's my truth, some are saying um, I try to look after myself, but I'm so, that it feels so selfish and this is helping. Some are saying the, the GD cheetah, dang it. Yeah. The, <laughs> and um, and Gunther asks where can um, he or she, I don't want to be presumptive, uh, or they get the book of course chase. i'm gonna pr yes thank you for saying he she or they chase you're such a good guy you really thank are you. thank you I, I, I um thank you that is <laughs> so i i i'd love to share something about that 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 just touched uh, a part of me that i don't really talk about but the i wrote a, a also a best-selling book in the fall last year called Creative Calling. And um, the process, it was my first book with words. I'm usually a picture book guy, so this is my first book of words. And uh, as someone who's not new to this, I'm like, it can't be this hard. And then partway through it, you're like, this is 10 times harder than I thought it would ever be. And um, I made a spreadsheet of every single example in the book 
and of every pronoun on every page. This was like a 10,000, maybe not 10,000, a thousand line spreadsheet to make sure that it was balanced and to make sure that it was equitable and to make sure that the the representation, and I'll tell you the first before, uh, and, and I have to give my wife, Kate, a ton of credit um, because she helped me with this as the spreadsheet person of the two of us. Um, but it was fascinating because what I found in doing this work and shared it with uh, my publisher, but, but had shared previous drafts with the publisher. Um, and the sentiment was, I said I was starting on this endeavor and they were like, oh my gosh, that's gonna take so much time. I was like, yeah, but there's no way I'm not, I'm not doing it without this. I need to know. And they said, well, when you read it, it feels balanced, right? And I was like, yeah, it feels pretty balanced but it's, I'm doing the work. And you can imagine this is a 300 page book. It's not, a, it's not an insignificant amount of work tracking every pronoun and every example. Uh, gender, um, the, the outcome of the example was a positive negative. And what felt great to every person I had read the book that was in the sort of the inner circle, because I asked this question, was unbelievably out of balance towards mm -hmm. all of the conditioning that we were raised with. And it was such an unbelievable uh, eye opener for me. And three and five trips through the work to change and adapt and modify and think outside of the conditioning was some of the most powerful and helpful work that I've ever done. And I can't go back. I think the, 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 the stuff's all around me, but every time I f hear or feel something and you, you, you caught, there was a second, it was like he or she or they, there wasn't, it wasn't like he, she, they, so I can't say my conditioning is completely unwired yet, but I, I don't know why I felt compelled to share that, but it is, it, it's an, it, well, I don't I think, think you felt compelled to share it because it's the most important story that we can hear. I, I am so uh, heartened by that story. Never hear, ever, ever hear that. I will be telling that story everywhere. I feel like that is what it takes. That is what it takes because what sounds right to us will always be status quo, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And status quo is, is imbalance, but it takes, and like, it takes people who care for no reason. Like you don't have to care. That is um, the example that I will give people when they ask me, what does allyship in art look like? That is it. Thank you. I cannot wait to tell Abby that story. <laughs> oh, I am a huge, huge uh, admirer of Abby as well. Please say hello to her. Um, I will. We have, we have the soccer history together, um, but what a, what a champion as well. I, I would love it if you'd share that with her. And I don't feel like the work is done, but you know, that was one of my questions is like, how, how can, um, we be better allies and maybe, maybe answered it without even having to me to having to ask it. I mean, it's such a beautiful example. I don't know what we could say that's better. It's just questioning everything, pushing everything. And also I think it's almost chase like if things that we're saying don't sound weird, we're not pushing it far enough. Like mm -hmm. what you said with like he, she, or they, like if it doesn't feel weird, we are artists and we're supposed to be ahead. We're supposed to be saying the things that sound weird now and five years from now will be as normal as it comes, right? I mean, Chase, I think we're gonna get to the point, I really, really think we're gonna get to the point where all of the ideas we have about gender are just yeah you know, i think we're gonna this idea of now that certain personality characteristics are gendered is gonna seem like archaic insanity right like yeah. we are gonna get to the point where we're not trying to raise like badass brave girls or like sensitive men like we're just gonna have this huge bucket of human characteristics right and we're gonna look at our babies and we're gonna say okay what do we do to make sure that this human being gets the permission to express this person's entire humanity, right? And nothing's going to be gendered. 
in the future. But it takes this kind of pushing and pushing and pushing. And by the way, what you didn't mention is that that's money, okay? Mm-hmm. It's money that that you have to say to your team, no, 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 we're going to stop and we're going to do, what all that is is dollar signs, dollar signs. That's what you have to put on the line yeah. in order to do the work well in this arena. So anyway. It, no, it does. And also, now that I'm thinking about it, it harkens back to the story that I was asking to of you to share around, well, these are people that care about you and that you respect and appreciate and admire. And you're, you, you, you've, you know, gone through the trenches with these people. And even those people who are like amazing, they're like, ah, yeah, it's pretty good. It's fine. You know, it's like, it's going to cost time and money and all that. And, and you're like, cool, cool. Trust you. We're doing it anyway. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, there is that I think it's a bit of continuity with what you said. Like, where where did that information come? And it's somewhere deep in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Gotta leave with that. Gotta leave with that. Nobody is gonna. We're in a different world, and people who are not leading with um, their truest self, who are not leading with heart, are just not gonna make it. Like, the truth sounds different. I said yes. it before. The truth sounds different. Um, we got a lot of people asking about the book. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that, uh, I'm looking at the Amazon. So that's probably a one area to get it in a world where it's the COVID world. Uh, do you have any other place where you want to send people to get untamed, which to me, third, third memoir, like, I don't know how someone writes three memoirs and has every one of them continue to get better and more badass, but. Anyway, sorry. Where 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 you want to steer people? Still people. Doozy, a doozy of a life, Chase. Um, <laughs> I prefer indies. Mm-hmm. Okay, I feel like right now, just go to look, go on IndieBound, go on Untamed.com. We have been working so hard. Untamedbook.com, I think, yeah. is what it is. We've been yeah. working so hard with the indies, trying to get as much business to them as we can because we need the bookstores to survive. The bookstores are the hearts of their communities, and we just really need them to be alive after this is over. So go to untamedbook.com and support your local indie. It's also on audio. It's it's a really good audio. It's awesome. <laughs> okay. Everybody, stop looking at Glennon for a second and look at me. You, the audio book is amazing. It's amazing. I love it when people do their own stunts. You in particular, Glennon, crushed it. So good. Sorry. Now back to you. Yeah. So wherever people get audio books in the air, <laughs> I'm amazing at this part, Chase. Go to your indie bookstore, get the get the hardcover Hard, there, yeah, or yeah. go get the audio, or get an ebook. Yeah. Now's a great time to 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 uh, do some of the digital stuff. But truly, if you can get the hard copy. A, that helps authors a ton, and um, it's something special to hold on to it. Um, I, I I know uh, I I, I want to ask one more question before I let you go. Um, and I think as humans, we're conditioned to um, pay attention to ourselves, pay attention to things that are outside of us, and and I'm just doing that in this question, and which is. Um, I personally talk a lot about there not being a map um, and that we have a compass and the difference between a map and a compass is a compass just points in a direction and a map pretends to show you like here's the red X and there's a bunch of dots and then over here is where the buried treasure and if you start here and you follow this red path you're going to end up here and we're sold these maps and these maps I don't know anybody whose life looks like the map that they were sold. I know a lot of people have a compass and trying to listen to your compass. There's this NPR article that was written about the book. I, 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 seriously, so many amazing reviews on the book for a good reason. But you said there is no map. What did you mean? I meant what you mean. It's the same? Well, I'm, I want to start writing. Yeah, well, they say I want to start writing and I just, I keep writing and I sound like you. I just keep, I keep getting to these things that are just about love and, and, and I'm like, that's because if it's true, it isn't new, right? That's because we're all just like digging to the center of the earth and there's only one center of the earth. So if we're all digging all over the earth, we're still going to get to the same thing in the middle, right? Like seekers will always discover this in the end. We try so hard to follow everybody else's directions. And at some point we realize I'm asking other people for directions to places they've never been. 
<laughs> because like each of nobody's ever lived the life that I've lived, that I'm living. Like our every life is an unprecedented and unrepeatable experiment. Right? Nobody's ever lived the kind of life that you've lived, that you're living with your pain and your past and your gifts and your constitution and your so the only answer, the only answer, if we want to live the like singular shooting star of a life we were meant to, is to throw away the idea that anybody has a map. And that's scary as hell because and figuring out that nobody knows, that there's like no Oz behind the curtain, that like we can't outsource our faith to ministers, that we can't out completely outsource our, our mental health to therapists, that we can't outsource our... Um, our, our spiritual lives to like um, female author gurus. Like we can't outsource ourselves at all. Nobody knows, but the good news is that you always know, right? And that's the compass. That is the single greatest gift of my life is figuring out that when I am brave enough to get still and let the snow settle for long enough, I will feel a nudge. And I, I, I can't know how else to describe it other than like a nudge. It's just like, it's not a voice. It's not, it's just like a kind of gravity of knowing what the next thing is. And then the bullshit of it all is that, that this knowing will never give you a five-year plan, right? It's always just the next right thing at a time, one thing at a time. But the beautiful part of that is that you can get all the way home that way, right? Just the one thing at a time. And once you commit to the next thing, it's like a yellow brick road. The next thing lights up. So, um, so the bad news is that nobody knows. The good news is that you know. <laughs> Thank you for in your own, in a way that only you can do, or that you do better than anybody I've ever read or paid attention to. Uh, show us this beautiful, um, I don't know, this the collision of the hardest things and the best things. Um, brutal, I think mm -hmm. is the way that you've said it so many times and so eloquently. Um, and for those folks out there who have uh, joined late, I have had the amazing privilege to sit down with you, Glennon. Um, the, every book that you write is incredible. This one to me, um, was, is transformative and the timing mm -hmm. could not be better. I don't, you know, the universe has a plan, um, to drop this book in a, in a way that, um, I, I can only imagine how hard and weird it is to be talking about your book in a, in a pandemic world and knowing that you're an introvert and you're happy to, from your home in Florida, be doing the book tour. Um, but it is so well-timed. Um, the moment in history, it's, uh, it's perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, where else can people, uh, we've talked about the book. What about you personally? Where do you want to steer people? At Glennon Doyle um, or you want to go to your, to yeah, and just No, I don't even do Momastery anymore. Just at Glennon Doyle on Instagram. That's where I hang out all the time. You can follow me on Twitter, but I suck at Twitter. So don't bother. Instagram <laughs> is my jam. At Glennon Doyle. And, and go to Together Rising too. If you are in a situation right now where you need some help, um, just it's the time to ask for help. You know, we are just working around the clock to get people food. We're not doing big projects right now, so don't write to me about your big project right now. We're trying to do like diapers and food and um, lights and rent and all of that. So if you are someone who has found yourself in a place where you could use some help, come on over to get Together Rising and write to us. We're like loaves and fishes over there. Thank you so much for that work too. The world is a better place because of, because of you and the team and what you've done. 25 million, um, totally remarkable, transformed so many lives. And I love you do a very good job of sharing the stories that help us understand that this money and your effort goes to a place that matters. So thank you. <sighs> I hate to sign off but uh, I want you to have some of your day back and thank you so much for showing up as you do. And we in the creative life community, myself personally, so grateful for your work and you, the human, please say hi to Abby and the family. And I can't wait to catch the uh, song that you sing every night to your dog tonight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you during honey. Good night song. Uh, thank you so much. Bye, Jay. Have so a great day. Have. Bye.